Coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. You know, first day you're usually figuring out where the fish will be feeding, what time of day, and then dialing in, okay, that night I knew, like with this throat sample, that these were the insects. And I'll always take a picture of those samples as well, because then you have like almost a journal. You have the time of day that you took that picture. You have um, the exact date. So years from now, you can remember and then you get a, a pure visual of the bugs that were hatching. And then you kind of, over the winter months, you scroll through those, those pictures and look at your fly box and be like, okay, yeah, that was on this lake. Um, these chronomids were coming off. I'm gonna tie six of these just in case for next season. And you, you just go nutty doing that. A great reminder for any fishing situation, Brandon knocks this one out of the park, including a banjo intro today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how you doing today? Quick reminder, at the end of this show, we'll be doing a listener shout-out and spotlight. You can DM me or send me a message on social anytime if you want to connect and uh, get a chance to uh, to connect with me and get a shout-out. Tokens Fly Shop, providing superior products at an affordable price, a great resource, an amazing resource for fly tying materials, tools, and fishing accessories. Since 2005, Tokens has been delivering on price, passion, and service. And now I want you to check out Tokens for yourself. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Tokens. You can get started right now. That's T-O-G-E-N-S. Tokens Online. You support this podcast by checking out that link and checking out Tokens. T-O-G-E-N-S. Brandon Moltzan is here to knock this one out of the Stillwater Park. We go deep on Stillwater tactics, get some of his top patterns for Stillwater, and find out which tools for tying he loves. Plus... We get a little insight into his dream home purchase, which he recently connected with. It got me fired up, uh, up in Kamloops in the forest. So this is a pretty cool story. Phil Roy, you've got a little competition, buddy, and I know you love it. So without further ado, here is Brandon Molsan. How are you doing, Brandon? Doing wonderful, Dave. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on. We're going to dig into a little bit on uh, back into Stillwater, fly tying, and uh, some fishing and we, we've done a few still water episodes over the years. Um, not as many as kind of some of the other stuff, but we're going to dig into that and you're up in the, up in Canada. There's a bunch of, that's kind of a hot spot. So, um, before we get into the fly tying still water and everything else, just take us back really quickly to your first, uh, how you got into fly fishing real quick. Sure, Dave. So yeah, I think I can relate to a lot of other fly fishers out there that, it, you know, the passion started at a very young age, kind of getting raised into it with my parents um every birthday or special occasion or even weekends we'd we'd be on a lake we'd either be renting a cabin or dragging the boat up to one of the the upper mountain elevation lakes and tons of like eager trout to really get you addicted to the game and i i would just be in awe of of my dad and his fly fishing and i just started out with like a, a spinning rod just trolling and just couldn't wait for the day to get my hands on a fly rod. And then so he showed me kind of the the ways and we used to just dry fly and catch all these little little guppies and it was just so much fun. And then fast forward a number of years, my brother bought me my first fly rod, just one of those cheap combo package deals. And And from then it was like every chance I could get on the water, I wanted to figure this thing out. And it wasn't pretty in the beginning, but you know, I had a lot of fun caught a lot of little fish and then over the years it's just progressed to trying to to in, increase my skills and uh, get into some bigger fish try some trickier trophy lakes and uh and here we are today um just immersing myself into fly tying and, and figuring out all that i can to be as productive as possible when i'm on the water there you go that sounds pretty good and and you're give us a rough uh kind of where you are you're up in canada but where are you up in uh, canada yeah, so a lot of the, the listeners will probably know, like the Kamloops area, the Merritt area, it's a real mecca for like BC interior lakes, um, tons of like trophy lakes and and people come from around the, the world to test those waters out. I'm uh, about an hour, hour and 15 minutes out of Kamloops in a town or in a city, I guess, called Vernon. 
And uh, I was actually born in Kelowna, if any of the listeners know where that is, and kind of been in the Okanagan off and on for my whole life. And yeah, this is this is home to me. I love the fishing around here. I love the opportunities that this area provides. That's it. And, and up there, is it mainly, you know, we always talk about still water fishing, but is that kind of where your focus is? And, and are there some other opportunities, uh, you know, kind of hitting rivers, streams, stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's predominantly in this area, um, we're in like a still water Mecca. And you, you, if you're willing to travel a little bit, like down at the, the lower mainland there, tons of river fishing for salmon and steelhead, um, some great like coastal fishing on the ocean um and then if you head a little bit more uh east you've got the kootenays and uh some really good stuff for cutthroat trout um and some like upper elevation little rivers creeks and streams that uh if you're willing to drive you know an hour two hours you can get into some pretty versatile territory there you go and then we've had i'll put some links in the show notes to uh we had a few, you know, Brian Chan covered the cam loops and Phil Roy's been on a couple of times. So we've got some good coverage up there. It seems like I've always coming back to the, uh, to that area because it's a hot spot. Um, yeah. but is it for you, you know, when you think of Stillwater, are you thinking, you know, are there other areas when you look out to fishing as far as kind of that bucket list for you, um, into the future, or are you just saying you got so much there, there's no reason to leave? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing is, is, uh, you know, winter is a long season and every year it seems to get longer and longer. I, I used to ice fish quite a bit as well, just to get me through. But now I think fly tines taken over my winter months, but like every spring season, I just make like a bucket list of, of local lakes. Like we're talking less than two hour drive. And I've got, I would say a hundred to 200 lakes that oh, I'm wow. like, Hey, I haven't even touched. I want to figure this out. And the thing for me is like, I've got my favorites. I, I continually go back to those ones because I know them. I know I'm going to have a good day, but it's like pushing yourself to go and try something new and figure out this new environment and, and connect all those little tricks of the trade that you've learned along the way to make it a successful day. And then once you have a successful day, you're like, Hey, I think I, you know, I caught 30 fish today. Maybe I can shoot for 40 tomorrow. <laughs> and so, so the allure locally is like, it's just all consuming, but I do have one, one trip in mind that, uh, I want to, I want to go and venture over into New Zealand. That's oh. where, um, my wife's side of the family is Her her mom's from New Zealand and, um, we've got some, some extended family over there. So would love to do a, a trip there and fish some of the, the river systems there. It just looks incredible for some big brown trout. Yeah, that's amazing. That is really cool. So yeah, so l- let's take it to the to lake you mentioned, kind of hitting some some newer, you know, a new lake. If you were, let's take it to, uh, you know, May, uh, if you were kind of looking at preparing for something in May. And I'm not sure even, you know, kind of the the ice off and all that stuff up there. But uh, but talk about that. First of all, let's start with May. W- what's that looking like? W- what are you getting prepared as you look out, you know, into that period? Yeah, so with, I would say with our season here, we got... We got lower elevation ice off that hits around, I'd say mid April. And that's when you can dust off the fly rods and get your, you know, your casting in check and um, kind of fine tune everything. Um, And as the season progresses in those lower elevation lakes, we're talking like early May, mid May, that's when it is just like chronomid heaven around here. And so I've got, I've got multiple boxes full of, chronomid flies size 20 all the way up to like size 12 size 10 like bombers some big big insects and so that's when the lakes are just flooded with anglers they're they're built Mm -hmm. up all this all this uh, apprehension over the winter and just (laughs) eager to get out and so it can be a bit of a gong show depending on the lake that you choose but everyone's pretty respectable and and gets out on the water and the in the shoal areas is uh, predominantly effective mm-hmm. anything like 20 feet or under and chronomids is the is the key there they will take a bunch of leeches leeches are kind of your year-round staple and same with some scuds um but uh, that's what people travel far and wide we get a ton of uh, traffic up from the lower mainland vancouver area and they flog the waters and and uh and try their hand at that yeah that's it and i'll put like i mentioned i've put some links out to i know phil a rolly covered a bunch on the still water, but take us to, you know, let's think of that new lake. So you're heading out to this, this lake you haven't been to before and you're going into it. What do you, how are you preparing for that? And, and, and take us there. How does that look? 
Sure. Yeah. So when I first get to the water, um, I, I've actually learned a lot of tricks and tips from from Brian Chan and Phil Rowley, and they've got some great instructional videos out there. I encourage everyone to check it out on their YouTube channels or their Still Waters website. But they've shown me like when you approach a lake, you look at all the variables. You don't just like hop on the water, start your engine and, and get out there, but to really look at the the minutiae, the details of the lake and like check the shoal areas, what insects are, you know, moving around in, in the weed beds. And, and as you're in your boat on the water, tour around the different bays, the shoals, you can look for like any, any bird activity, the swallows will come down and take any insects off the, the top of the water. So I'm usually scouting out for those little things. I'm scouting to see if there's any, um, any fish that are, are porpoising or any activity there of, of surface feed. Um, and then as well, you can get one of those little, um, aquarium nets and in the shallows there, just, you know, dip that in and you can usually find some specimens of what's going to be, you know, the, the meal of the day, um, and then I'll spend some time just searching. And so I've got a, a box full of different searching patterns, some some leeches, some attractor patterns. And I'll usually throw that on for my first go. And once I'm into a fish that uh, I can take a little throat sample of, it'll give me a better idea of then, then how to like dial in. Um, okay, they're on chronomids today. It seems to be this size, seems to be this color. And as a fly tire, like we go insane trying to match like the right the right rib color, the right proportions, the right length, you know, gills, no gills, depending on like water clarity. Uh, like I said, we drive ourselves just absolutely nutty trying to <laughs> like find every single specimen of the lake. And, and then, you know, once you start locating where the fish are actively feeding, it's a matter of setting up your, your leader, your rod, uh, for the appropriate depth of what you're going to be fishing those bugs at. Cause they'll, they're, they're lazy. They'll, they'll feed a smorgasbord at a certain water column depth. They won't move up. They won't move down. So you're continually like fiddling with your gear and, and trying to, you know, get those nonstop indicator down moments. Um, and usually when I start, um, chronomid fishing like that, uh, I've had great success with like anything, just simple black, black thread color, uh, red rib really stands out white bead head or else like black with a, a silver or tinsel rib. Those are seem to be like some great early season chronomids to, to start your day out. Yeah, there you go. And those are, and when you say searching patterns, are you talking, and it sounds like you're talking just chronomids early on, or do you have other patterns that aren't chronomids for searching patterns? Yeah, no, I, I use a, a variety of things. My, my searching patterns, usually I tend to go to some leeches. Um, Brian Chan's got like one of my favorite leech patterns that he designed, um, the ruby eyed leech. So it's got a blend of some red maroon sort of black, um, like semi seal, uh, material. So it's really lifelike in the water. And then it's got a, a brass, uh, cone head bead with a little ruby or, or like red colored bead right in behind that. I've got a, a video coming up on, on uh, Togan's YouTube channel in the next couple of weeks. That's going to show kind of a how to of that, uh, pattern. And that's like a great searching pattern because it's, it's imitative, but yet it's going to represent a lot of those little micro leeches that are, are cruising the shoals looking for their nutrients. And you can usually get into fish with that. Um, there's another, another pattern that I like to use, and I just recorded a video of it. Um, it's a, a, a bruised egg sucking leech pattern. And so in some of the still waters that have, uh, like whether they're spawning trout or some of the still waters here have like a salmon population that'll come through and they'll lay their eggs. Um, and then these leeches will grab one of those eggs and, and start swimming away with it. And so it, uh, kind of ignites like a, a predatory strike from the fish. And so if you're ever on any of those type of still waters, you can usually, you know, grab one or two fish and see what they're, uh, they're feeding on and then you just dial it in further from there. But I'd say those two searching patterns have been most successful to me. Mm -hmm. And if those don't work, um, you know, the, the popular UK blobs and boobies mm -hmm. and something really flashy and gaudy and obnoxious, they just, they sample that they, they want to see what it is or they want to get rid of it. And, uh, and so that, that accounts for some vicious takes as well. Mm. 
and how are you doing when you talk searching patterns? So how, how would you be fishing some of these patterns? Yeah, so a multitude of ways. Um, sometimes if I'm just checking out the lake in the area, um, I'll do just a very slow troll on, you know, either a, a full sink or an intermediate fly line. And just as I'm, you know, looking for activity, there's no shame in in uh, trolling a fly line and, and seeing what you can you can grab along the way. And then if you do find like a spot where you think, OK, there's going to be some fish here. Um, I utilize a, a fish finder as well. And so you can see some of the fish subsurface and, and what level those ones are at. And so if you're locked into one of those areas, then I'll, I'll anchor. And um, like most still water guys, you have an anchor in the front that you'll drop and then an anchor at the back. So the wind doesn't throw your boat around. Um, you can really have control over your lines that way. And yeah, I'll, I'll cast out, I'll do some, some slow retrieves, usually on like an intermediate line, um, fishing in the, the shallower waters. And that's another, um, option to get really, really successful at just searching, seeing what they're going to be eating. And, uh, so yeah, but there's no, there's no written in stone thing yeah. about that. It's, it, you know, everything changes day to day and depending on what body of water you're hitting as well. Right. Right, right. And and what is the slow, I mean, I know there's all sorts of different types of retrieves, but when you say slow, how would you uh, describe that? Oh, good, good question, Dave. Yeah, so slow retrieve. Um, there's a lot of good videos out there of like a, it's called like a, a hand twist retrieve. Um, it's a little trickier to describe, but if you just search yep. hand twist, you know, fly, fly retrieve, kind of a figure eight between right. your, your, your index and your pinky. And then, um, most, I'd say most beginner fly fishermen, they, they, they strip a little bit too fast and, and certain times, yeah, it warrants that, but I find the most success is just being as, as slow and monotonous as possible. Um, especially early season, the fish are just getting up their appetite. They're, um, yeah, they're not in full blown, um, yeah, feeding frenzy mode yet. Uh, so a slow hand twist retrieve, or if you're really patient, you can just take it, you know, inch by inch, you give a little harder strip here or there to turn some heads. Um, but that's what I mean when I say yeah. slow twist retrieve for, um, for chronomid fishing, it's like, go, go slow in your mind. You should be, yeah, you should be like, oh, this is painfully slow. And then you want to slow it down further than oh, that. Wow. And that's like the key for a lot that's of chronomid uh, fishing because they'll they'll swim up in that vertical column. They're not going to be moving um, laterally. So that's where, you know, you can really play some some good wind drifts to your advantage. Um, but, but slow is best. Slow and is then, best. yeah, just to make sure that everyone's set up for any of those, like the blob or, or booby fishing, those ones you do want to strip in a little bit faster because fish will often like inhale those. And I always fish like barbless because I don't want to mess up the throats. Usually I'm just a catch and release fisherman. Um, but with those blobs, they'll inhale it. So you always want to make sure that you got tension on the line. And if you, you strip those a little bit faster, then, uh, it seems to entice a lot more takes. Nice. Nice. Okay. That, that's a good little summary there. And you mentioned, um, boat, uh, just quickly on, on your boat or what are you using? Like, uh, just kind of a John boat or what do you, what do you got there? Yeah. So I have, like when I first started out, I was just a, a float tube man. Mm -hmm. I just throw that in the pickup truck and keep it in the, the truck at, at work and inflate it when I'm at the, the launch sites. Um, and then a couple of years ago we got into, it's a, a Prince craft, uh, Yukon 14 foot boat. So it's kind of a, a good boat for every, everything that I fish. I would love to add like a, uh, a 10 or 12 foot John boat in the future, but this 14 footer, like we do some, uh, some fall salmon fishing. We'll do, um, like both sockeye and Chinook fishing. Some of the lakes, the bigger lakes can get a little bit hairier for the smaller John boats. So this, this thing's pretty stable i've got a uh, a young two-year-old daughter and she'll come with me the odd time so i want to make sure that she feels safe and i've got a uh the 25 horse two-stroke mercury on the back so mm -hmm. you, you can get out of trouble in in a hurry and then i've added a 55 pound minn Kota, um traxxas to the back of that and so for for trolling or just even adjusting your setup um you know moving out five feet when you're when you're into into fish you don't want to spook them so you you drop that down very very gently um and and you can move in or out you know five ten feet not to spook any fish 
That's awesome. That's all. Awesome. And could we get a look at that boat on your, is that on your Instagram or somewhere out there? Yeah, I think I've got some pictures on, uh, on Instagram and, and Facebook there. Uh, if not, I'll, I'll add a few. It's, it's a nice setup. It's, it's comfortable for, you know, two to three people. You can stand in it, you can relax and have, have lunch and, and just a ton of storage for, for everyone's belongings and all my, all my fly boxes and fly rods. It gets a little carried away sometimes. But <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. So, and then, uh, and on that fly line, uh, as far as the, um, you mentioned intermediate, what do you use there? What do you recommend if somebody's going to pick up an intermediate line? Yeah, there's, oh man, there's great technologies out there now. Um, we're, we're pretty spoiled. I currently I'm fishing scientific anglers. They've got a, a, a camo line mm-hmm. and, um, and then I've got another slow sink scientific anglers line. Maybe it's like a, a one, one feet per second line. Um, but, but pretty slick. They make some good stuff. I have a couple Rio lines as well. They're really improving their technologies and I do like their products. And then uh, I haven't tried the airflow fly lines, but I'm hearing a lot of good stuff. I'll have to get my hands on some of that and, and see how it compares. But there's, there's like great technologies out there depending on your budget. I don't think you can go wrong. Um, I, I do believe, you know, I, 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 tend towards scientific anglers a lot more than any other fly lines just because i've had some great memories and great moments mm-hmm. with with their stuff but yeah camo camo line uh some of it's like a clear intermediate yeah. or else it could be like a dark sort of dark green depending on the sink rate as well gotcha okay and and i wanted to dig back into and in a little bit into like some more flies you, we mentioned some searching patterns but some more flies but uh but you mentioned togans on the youtube channel let's just take a quick uh, little uh, break here and just connect you to togans and uh it, take us there so how did that how did that first meeting happen to togans because you're mentioning these youtube channels do you pretty much tie uh with togans or tie, yes. do you tie your, your videos you can see on togans website yeah yeah absolutely so um that's been like just an unreal experience so going back a little bit um yeah i was basically long story short too cheap to buy flies right i didn't want to spend like three bucks on on a chronomid that i could you know yeah. tie myself and and especially the array of chronomids that you want to fish and and have available i'm like i'm gonna go broke here so <laughs> let's uh, let's figure out this uh fly tying business so um looking online and I, and I heard a lot of great reviews about this, this Togan's fly shop. And I was like, okay, well, let's, let's put an order together with them and see what they're all about. And, um, and yeah, I bought just a bunch of hooks and beads and, and threads and ribs. And, um, it's, you know, they've got their website very clearly laid out. It's really nice if you're, you know, as meticulous as I am where I'm, I'm building these flies in my head before I order all the products and like, okay, I need, you know, two spools of this. I need some ribs here. I need, um, and yeah, I got my first order in the mail from them. And unfortunately there was like a, a couple hooks that weren't the right ones that I ordered. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. Right. Like I work in the, in the retail industry and I'm, I, I'm always getting that. I want to speak to the manager conversations. Right, right. Like, hey, you know, I can just suck it up. And then I was like, no, you know, I'll just reach out to them and, and see, see what's going on. And, um, so yeah, I sent him, I think it was just a, an email and like, kid you not Dave, like two minutes later, I get a, uh, I get a, an email back from him just saying like, Oh, Brandon, we're so sorry. Like, listen, that's our gift to you. Um, you keep those hooks. If you want to use them by all means, if you want to get them over to some friends or whatever, they're yours and we'll ship out, uh, ship out your, your correct hooks mm. immediately. And I was just like, wow, like That's cool. number one, they get back to you like immediately. Number two, when you, when you get your, your order, it's like a, a handwritten message. Like it's, it's so personalized. Um, and I was like, wow, like this is, this is great customer service. I'm all about that. Um, so doing a few more orders through them and just building up my fly boxes and then, uh, I, yeah, so I'm starting to tie, I'm, I'm getting my stuff out there on social media and one of the, the pro team members that Togans has, uh, Stanton Jack, brilliant, brilliant chronomid tire. And he's got some killer like mayflies and damsels. The guy can do it all. He reaches out to me and says, um, Hey Brandon, like loving the stuff you're putting out. Would you ever consider like joining a pro team? And I'm just like, Holy cow, it's, it's happening. <laughs> and, uh, 
And it was just like, I, I remember reading that message and I'm just like shaking. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I would absolutely love that. Not only do I just like, I'm so passionate about fly fishing and, and fly tying. I'm like, to be able to like, to get on board with a pro team, it's just a dream come true. So um, he gets in contact with with Togans and, and Justin and Sherry at the shop there. They reach out to me and they're like, hey, we'd love for you to... To, to come on board with us we love what you're putting out on social media on you know i've got some videos on on tiktok oh, on cool. this little youtube channel and yeah. just having fun with it right like showing um showing other tires what what can be done and i was very grateful for like the the social media aspect and some facebook groups of like learning different patterns and learning from these skilled tires they're so generous with sharing this information that i'm like man i gotta i gotta pay this forward as well and and really um, show some detailed videos and, and how to's. And, um, so they're like, we love what you're doing, Brandon. Like, you know, we want you to, to do that and, and keep doing it. Um, and we want to supply you with some products to, to be able to fish and, and learn, you know, research and development of what's working, what patterns you can tie with our stuff. And yeah, they've been, uh, they've been so good to me, like so communicative and, I'm looking forward to things now, hopefully opening up a little bit with COVID restrictions where yeah. we can get together with the team members and, right. and, uh, you know, fish some lakes together. I know that they, they've got a site on one of the, the premier lakes in the interior here. And so they want to bring everyone out and just have, you know, a good week of fishing or a good, uh, good couple of days on the water together. That sounds pretty awesome. Well, and, and on the YouTube channel, so when you do these videos, is that kind of, uh, you know, just up to, I mean, how do you get into that? You know, do you just say, Hey, this is a pattern I'm using this week and tie it. Or how do you kind of dig into what you're going to be tying? No, that's a good question. Cause it's, it's always like, it can be overwhelming of, of the different yeah. patterns out there and, and you see some great stuff. And, and for me, it's always come back to what am I actually going to tie on my fly line to fish? Yeah. You know, there's, there's so much uh, creativity and, and it really boils down to, you know, if you have maybe eight different types of flies we're talking like chronomids leeches some attractors some dry flies scuds damsels if you've got like a, a knockout pattern of each of those sort of categories and you know how to fish it and the time to fish it that's when you can be like really successful for so for me when i'm like thinking up a pattern or wanting to tie something it's usually out of like necessity looking at my fly box and being like okay i don't have i don't have enough scuds i don't have enough in different sizes of them maybe different colors whether i've got some like light olives medium olives dark olives um you know if they have the the pregnant belly little little orange hot spot on them or bead head no bead head so i'll usually like stick to a main category and then kind of put some spins on it. So I have some variety of that, uh, category. And then, uh, you know, sometimes you just get, you get into maybe like a writer block type of yeah. deal where you're just not motivated and, and it's like, well, that's fine too. Take a few days off. Like, um, I think finding the balance of with social media, it can be all consuming and it can really get overwhelming where you're like, Oh man, I gotta, I gotta keep pumping out. Right. Um, the product here machine, and, yep. yeah and it's like that's not what it's all about like i should be inspired in my ties and and not trying to just get that next like um but for me so sometimes i'll go like you know a couple of weeks where i'm just not inspired and then an idea an idea will will click and like lately i've been getting into some uh some mayfly spinner patterns and trying this um wally wing technique with some feathers and some this mm -hmm. origami technique with feathers and i'm just like holy cow this is like this is next level these things look like uh totally imitative and and you can get so specific and and every little um tail fiber on this mayfly it's got to be tied in exactly where it needs to be so it really scratches kind of those you know, those, those uh, meticulous tendencies or where you can just sit and zen out and really get specific on these little arts and crafts, you know? Yeah, totally. Now, and, and if you look at, let's take it back to that, that May period again, and you, and you said coronamids or, or the money. When you mentioned all these other flies, you know, even dry flies, scuds, damsels, is there anything else that you're going to be having in your box during that period or is it pretty much all coronamids? Yeah, there's, I, I mean, yeah, I've, I think I I usually bring with me, you know, seven or eight fly boxes just in case. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, 
those days, it's like, if you can dial in the chronomid hatches, like, why would you, why would you leave that where every, you know, every cast, every indicator that's, that's in the water, you're getting action throughout. Um, it's like, wh- why change it up? But there's certain times in the day where the, the hatches will stop and either you've got to go locate a new spot in the lake. Um, I think that's my, my real learning curve is like not being stuck in one area just because it worked an hour ago doesn't mean it's going to produce the next hour. So it's being, being nimble. And that's where those other fly patterns come in as you progress throughout the season. Um, there's other insects that come readily available, you know, depending on the elevation that you're, you're fishing at the water temperature, all those factors, uh, you know, play a role in, in what fly to select certain times of the day, they'll start surface feeding on dry flies. So it's like, Hey, you better have some some mayflies, you better have some, you know, elk hair caddises. Um, and, and it can just, you know, it can really vary. I should, should say as well with, um, with the chronomids, like a super effective pattern to start early season, uh, is bloodworms. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have like a good variety of some well-tied bloodworms, the skinnier, the better, the simpler, the better. Um, that seems to be kind of a, a staple for them early season. There you go, blood one. And then uh, and the flies, you said elk or caddis, um, dry flies. Why, are there any, maybe a couple of top ones or those kind of two? You mentioned mayflies. Is that uh, is there a pattern or a type of fly you'd recommend? Yeah, I really like the, um, there's some there's some different, uh, yeah, different color elk or caddis. The old tom thumb has been like a staple of mine as well. Oh, nice. Um, with the imitative like mayfly patterns, yeah. Um, I didn't realize this till, till recently, but there's, there's different, like different levels that those insects will sit in the, in the water surface. So sometimes they'll sit just subsurface as they're getting ready to hatch. And so that's where you want to tie on, like maybe it's like a, uh, uh, parachute atoms or a, a clink hammer variety, right. um, where it just gets that, that body of the insect below the surface. Um, and like these fish, they're brilliant because if that's the hatch that's feeding sub or that's going off subsurface, they won't touch anything else. Like some of the trophy lakes, cause they see so many flies that you got to really be dialed in. So it's like even that little half inch suspension of that fly is going to make a difference. And then certain times they, you know, if the mayflies are, are, um, are hatching and, and, and reproducing and, and that's where they come back to the water and, and you use those mayfly spinners. So if you have, have, you know, the, the right wing, um, you know, representation, uh, and they're sitting right on top of the water, that's going to be lights out. But man, we, we go like just crazy trying to figure out these little, <laughs> little details just in the hopes of like that next fish or that, that better day with a little bit more activity. But, uh, it's, yeah. as you can hear from just the, the smile on my face, like it's, it's all consuming and, yeah. and I just love it. You gotta be ready. It sounds like you gotta be ready if you're out there, you know, fishing, like you said, you could be intermediate and maybe slowly stripping some flies trying to find the fish but if you see a hatch come off of whatever you got to be ready to switch like right away to dry flies is that kind of the situation you got a rod ready to go yeah yeah in in bc here we can fish if you're by yourself so i usually like fishing by myself because then i can fish two rods (laughs) so i can have um kind of i'll have if they're on chronomids i'll have a chronomid setup going and then maybe i'll be doing like an intermediate uh setup on my other line or a full sink um and kind of figuring out okay if they're not onto chronomids i can kind of uh, multitask and uh certain times it gets chaotic where you get two fish and, and get a double header and you're like hey how do i even reel these in and and uh, you're crossing lines and, and then you got to <laughs> tie on you know new leaders and it's it's all good but uh, it can get a little little hectic when it's good but uh yeah 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 that's and then um there's just there's such a a variety of things to try like not only are you trying to match the right insect but it's like the right retrieves the right depths um there's there's a lot of variables but on some of the lakes too like you, you'll catch fish no matter what you throw out there there's certain strains of trout as well that are a lot more eager so that's where i suggest for anyone taking their their youngsters or if you want to have just a good day of high activity get into some of the lakes that have um like a black water strain mm. or you know some of the the more natural spawners um some of the lakes that don't get as much activity maybe they're smaller fish but um you're gonna have a lot more more fish on especially to keep your youngsters involved 
Yeah, that's cool. So one of those with those lakes with the maybe the smaller wild fish. What was your tip there? Or your recommendation? Yeah, I, I would just say like, um, I mean, you're saying just find those because they're more aggressive fish. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, a lot of them won't be as like those lakes won't be as fished out, or else the stocking program. Um, you know, side note that that the BC Fisheries does an amazing job with their their stocking programs, and they like they'll um, introduce um specific strains to specific waters depending on like what's going to be good for that lake and for the future they won't they won't cross rainbow strains and put big panasks in with with uh natural feeders um black waters um they'll they'll keep it specific so like one of the 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 lakes that i used to go to when i was a kid it would be stocked every year with, um, I think like between 20,000 to 30,000 fish. So they're going to be smaller, but you're going to get a lot more activity out of your day. And those fish are going to be a little bit more juvenile, eager to eat whatever flies by. So you could tie on a piece of yarn hmm. and, uh, and have a successful day. Um, and then certain lakes are managed so that they've got far less fish, but the fish get much bigger. And then I know Brian Chan talks about it with either diploid or, or the triploid strain. So a triploid is like a non-reproductive yep. um, strain. And that's where they're just eating machines. They grow to eat. They don't put their energy into spawning. So in those trophy lakes, it's like, yeah, you can get a nine, 10 pound fish, like no, no problem. Um, but you're going to have far few fish that day compared to like the lake that has 30,000 eager juvenile trout in it. That's right. And where would you go? I know uh, Brian, I think, talked about this when he was on, but if you, to find out where, you know, these lakes, where the black water, the different types or where to fish, where, where would you send somebody? Yeah. So in NBC there, I believe it's called, um, oh, shoot, I'm drawing a blank here, but it's, it's BC fisheries. There's, um, there's a, a stocking report. And so if you just search that out, you can search any Perfect. body of water that the BC fisheries is going to supply and manage. And, um, and you can dial it in from region. You can dial it into like the strain of the fish as well. So they do like a remarkable um, job. If you're just, you know, if you're planning your your spring and your summer, you can kind of take notes of these lakes that you want to try. And then with more experience, you learn, okay, well, these, these fish typically like these type of flies or at this time of the year, they're going to be more likely to feed on this stuff. And you can cater your, your trip that way as well. They do a rem- remarkable job with that. Togan's Fly Shop has been providing superior quality products for a long time now, actually since 2005. So we're going to be going on 20 years here pretty soon. Togan's uh, covering a bunch of unique products. They've got their own in-house products and a bunch of leading manufacturers and brands. They've got a really cool fly tying subscription box you can check out right now. You're only one click away at Togan's. This episode with Brandon is definitely a tribute to what Togans has going on out there. So if you haven't hadn't checked them out right now, if you need some fly time materials, even if you're brand new, you can check them out. They got a great YouTube channel. We're going to dig into that today with Brandon, some of the flies they have out there, some of the ambassadors and things like that. But uh, just a great chance for you to connect with Togans. And I'm happy to be spotlighting this episode today. Like I said, Almost 20 years, Togans has been over delivering on price and customer service. And I want you to check it out right now and get on with that buzz. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Togans, T-O-G-E-N-S. Take a look at their diverse selection of products today. You support this podcast right now by clicking over to Togans. Click over wetflyswing.com slash T-O-G-E-N-S, Togans, and, uh, and support us by just checking it out right now. Thank you in advance if you had a chance. So we're kind of going along this track, uh, you know, talking a little fly tying, and we haven't really dug in much on fly tying uh, tips and things like that. We've talked about a few patterns. Uh, maybe you can just get, give us a couple uh, of tips, you know, thinking about tying. We, we mentioned a few things. We haven't dug into scuds or damsels. Maybe we could start there, fill out one more fly. What would be a damsel fly you would be putting on, and how different is that, say, than, than fishing some sort of a leech? Okay. Yeah. So I'd say very, very similar in the presentation and, and your retrieve, um, short one to two inch strips, pretty slow. The damselflies like to have a little pause. They'll, they'll swim and pause. Um, and so similar retrieve to how you'd fish a leech, 
always fishing them in kind of the shoals. Sometimes you're in like, you know, three feet of water, um, really shallow. And then certain times you're just in the, in the drop offs, anything under like 20 feet. Um, one of my favorite patterns I've got, uh, I've got a couple, maybe I've got a video and a few pictures on my, my social there, but, um, there's, uh, a, a, a damselfly nymph pattern that I tie in. It's like a light olive and an olive and a ginger color. So it's like a real faint sort of beige color. And those three, it's tied with, with a marabou tail. And the body of it is just the marabou fibers um, twisted up with the rib. And then I add some Togan's 1 16th like matte black beads for the eyes. And I'll usually tie those in with um, with a piece of like 20 pound um, fluoro test in between the eyes just to make sure that like I've had some some crazy days with those where I used to tie them with just wire to keep those eyes together. And, uh, and the fluoro 20 pound holds those eyes on there a lot better, but, um, yeah, I have got pictures of those, um, a how to video as well. And I think for damsel flies, those are like, those are my favorite. I think those are one of my favorite flies to tie. They're super easy for anyone just like beginning and learning to, you know, the characteristics of marabou, um, you can go in like tons of different colors. And I think it was Phil Rowley, maybe someone else, but it stuck with me. What he said is he's like, if you look at the color of the shoals and the color of the vegetation, it gives you a pretty good indication of what, what uh, damselfly or what scud to tie on. Cause they're pretty good at camouflaging themselves into that. And they'll actually adapt to their environment that way. So it's a good, good tip that I learned. Yeah, that is amazing. Yeah. So fine. So look around at the shoals, like the veg, just the vegetation. And if you, if it's kind of lighter in color, then that's probably something is going to be the color of the, the insect. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and as far as like size for those flies, um, I tie a lot of those damsel flies on like a size, I guess a size 14, um, like Togan's curved nymph hook. It gives it a really nice profile, a little bit of a, an arched back on them. And then I'll tie those like 14s, some, some smaller 16s. Um, and then same with, with scuds, I'll usually use a, uh, either like a three X heavy scud hook or just a regular scud hook. And I'll tie those anywhere from 18s to, to number, number 10s on those scud hooks. And with a similar, similar approach to where you want to match light olive, dark olive, you know, a ginger type you can add like i said a little bit of like fluorescent orange dubbing to the middle i think i've got one one scud video i'll have to tie up a, a few more videos of those um because they're they're super effective and in the the still waters in the bc interior um you've got scuds year round that's like a staple oh, okay. food source for the fish so you're really you're an imitative pattern and depending on the size and the color you can have some really successful days just fishing scuds and are scuds fish differently than, or maybe explain that. How, how would you fish a scud? Sure. Yeah. So a couple of different, different options for scuds. Um, typically I've been the most successful with, with the same intermediate line. You're getting, uh, you're getting that fly kind of suspended in the water column. And the nice thing about that intermediate fly line is, um, once you calculate the, the, sorry, the inches per second of it, um, how, how far it's going to drop down in that water column. You can really dial it in to know exactly what, uh, you know, if you want to get it just a foot off the bottom, okay, well, I'm sitting in six feet of water. That's, you know, X amount of seconds. And, and with that retrieve, um, the scuds will swim in like short little bursts. And so, you know, a little bit more of an aggressive, um, strip retrieve, um, but with, with some pauses. And I've also seen recently on, on a few guys' videos that they'll tie those scuds in like a swimming pattern. So more of a flattened out pattern using like a curved nymph hook. Um, cause when they're, when they're in motion like that, they, they straighten out and then they'll curve up again, right. like a tiny little, little prawn or a little shrimp. Um, but I would say a lot of those retrieves, like, you know, you, you, you change your timing a little bit depending on the day, the fish activity, but intermediate lines will really give you an advantage there. Um, and then you can just vary your, your strip, throw in a few more aggressive strips to, to catch the attention of maybe fish that are swimming nearby and then, uh, get it with kind of that natural movement, some quick one inch strips. And, and if you, um, I know some guys get crazy and, and they have aquariums full of insects. And so, mm -hmm. 
there's there's some videos out there as well of, of them just recording like the insects in these aquariums and so you can see kind of firsthand how these things are swimming and then you dial that into your 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 retrieve and uh and you'll be a lot more successful that's great yeah yeah i love the aquariums in, in the uh, you know with your own insects that's pretty sweet so and then what are the you mentioned a few channels what would be some of your you know either like fly tying channels or other like youtube channels that you followed over over the years I think like I had someone ask me just recently, I, I actually sold some flies to them and they were, it was a gift for, for her husband. And she says like, he's, he's never fished, you know, the, the chronomid style of fly fishing. He's, he's newer to fly fishing in general. So I, I shared with, with her a couple of links. There's, um, sport fishing on the fly. So the Freshy brothers and Brian Chan do an incredible job of like some tutorials. They'll showcase different lakes around the BC interior. They've got a couple, like, I think the ones like 40 minutes long of just chronomid techniques. And I think like during COVID we were all self isolating and I just filled my brain with like yeah. <laughs> with all these, all these videos, all these knowledge. I'm, I'm taking notes and writing things down. So sport fishing on the fly on YouTube, they've got a, a Facebook uh, page as well. Mm-hmm. Very influential to me. So thank you very much guys nice. for just sharing, sharing that knowledge. And then locally there's, um, BC fly guys. So a couple mm-hmm. of guys representing them and they'll do live tying events. They'll put out some great videos, more specific to like fly tying and, and getting, you know, your, your chronomid tapers just, just right, keeping them slim. And so I've got to say a huge thank you to those guys as well. They, uh, they got me going and, uh, and, and it's a fun activity too. If you're sitting at the bench and you're tying and you want, you know, a little bit of, of, uh, a social outlet, you can have some, some zoom calls or go on these live events and ask questions and, uh, it becomes a fun little community for sure. That's cool. Yeah. Well, let, let's take a little break. We're going to do this little segment called uh, our trivia night segment, and uh, and how this is going to work is I'm just going to uh, I've got a little trivia I'm going to ask, and then everybody listening can head out to wetflyswing.com/trivia, and they can answer the question if they have it. And the first person that answers is going to get uh, tokens is going to uh, deliver a like a grand prize and we don't have that exactly what we'll kind of uh right now i don't have that on hand but we're going to deliver that and then we're going to give some other bonuses for those that subscribe to the channel so so basically the trivia question and this might be a hard one i'm not sure but it's uh you know the question is is odd uh when did we first start uh mention tokens on the podcast and for those that have been listening uh or those that haven't you could probably go to the website and maybe do some searching uh, for yourself and find out. So this might be a tough question, but I'm going to give it to the person that's closest. So it doesn't even have to be exact. It's whoever gets this closest. Um, but yeah, but part of this is just, you know, providing a little more value on, on the trivia, you know, on, on just kind of what you're talking about here. And and you mentioned a few, que- uh, I mentioned a few questions about tying, but what do you think when somebody comes in and they tie, you know, they have some questions about tying, um, and it sounds like you've been a pretty rapid process to get to where you are. What do you tell somebody that's, you know, wanting to get better at tying still water patterns or just patterns in general? No, that's a great question there, Dave. Um, what I would suggest to anyone that's just starting out, um, there's a, there's a ton of like Facebook social media groups. Um, mm-hmm. the one that's been like, an absolute standout for me is called still waters. Oh, nice. And so it's, it's, um, a BC group, but what I love about it is, um, there's no, there's no bullying. There's no, you know, shaming, anything like that. Some guys will put out their, their pictures of their ties and being like, Hey, you know, a little friendly, constructive criticism. What's, what can I work on? What can I, you know, uh, change about this fly? And I know for me, like I had a couple buddies that when I was first getting into it, I'd, I'd send them just pictures and I'd be like, Hey, this, you know, this is my first like bead headed, you know, one with gills and like, hey, what do you think? And, and so, um, a lot of us fly tires, like we have no problem answering some questions and reaching out. And, and I've met some great friends along the way that have just like, Hey Brandon, I watched your video the other day. Um, check out, you know, this is my representation of what you tied, mm. like any oh, peaks. Nice. And so the biggest encouragement is like, don't, don't beat yourself up. Be, uh, be kind to yourself. I've kept a few of my flies, like my first ties. And it just as kind of a, a gauge of like, okay, this is, this is how I started. Um, I used to tie some, some leeches with, 
uh, I've got a, uh, he's a, a Bernadoodle, a big black dog. And so I would, uh, I would take little snippets of his tail and I'm like, this is just great leech material. <laughs> and like, I've caught some great fish on, on those flies. But when I first tied that, I'm like, how do I even wrap this on a hook? Do I just wrap the entire strands up and then try to get this thread around it? And it was just abysmal. So don't hesitate to reach out to some of these, you know, these great fly tires. And depending on your region, they're going to have like more specifics to either the river systems or the lakes that, you know, are effective. So find whatever, you know, local, local group, local tires and, uh, and ask them questions. I would say, more often than not, these guys are more than willing to to lend a hand. If you ask like, hey, what, what lake were you fishing on or what, you know, they're not going to give out those secrets, but uh, pretty generous when it comes to sharing some tips and tricks. And, and that's what's helped me um, progress, you know, very quickly in this, in this, uh, in this hobby. That's right. That's right. And you're, uh, I was just thinking, uh, you know, getting started and talking about, you mentioned the kind of the vice, well, your, your chant, your, um, Instagram is remind us again what what's the name of your Instagram uh, handle? Yeah, it's uh Tyne is my vice and exactly this is spelled V I S E. V I S E, yeah, that's great. So Tyne is my vice, a great great name and and uh and so what is your vice? So so give me your vice. So what are you tying on first of all and then and then give me your vice on the other vice. Oh sure. <laughs> <laughs> um so I started just on one of those cheap little regal imitated uh, knockoff vices. Uh-huh. Yep. And it was great, you know, the, the rotary function, like I had it fall off the table more often than not. And uh, But to get, you know, get the patterns down to just practice on your thread wraps and stuff, a great little tool for anyone beginning. Um, you can pick up vices for, I don't know, like $40 to $100 and, and they're great. And then for a Father's Day present, my wife surprised me with a, uh, a Renzetti Traveler, and mm-hmm. it's in like the the black edition, so it just looks it looks slick. It's very minimalistic. Mm-hmm. It's got the rotary function. It's got like the bobbin cradle. I added a material clip to it, and I've got that one on a on a pedestal, so I can I can take that you know even in the boat with me. Um, if there's ever like a fly that I don't have in in my boxes upon boxes then i can always just spin up something to match the hatch i've taken that on like fishing trips as well when you're back at the camp and like some of the best moments are thinking about that next day on the water and like oh i should probably tie up a few of these and and you know you're chatting with buddies of what worked for them that day um so those vices they're they're relatively inexpensive a great product great value and i just love like the simplicity of it right it's like very minimalistic. You can have a lot of room to work around that vice. Um, so the travel kit, you mentioned like the boat, which is amazing, right? You're out in your boat, you've got your kit, uh, popping it out, tie flies. I mean, my struggle has always been with my fly tying kit. I mean, I've got so many materials. How do you pack a little fly tying travel kit? What, what's your kit look like? Yeah, <laughs> It's funny because I think that's that's the struggle and and why I have like a, a fourteen foot. <laughs> yeah, you got your whole you got your whole kit in the boat, <laughs> your whole thing. The suitcase of materials with me. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I when I first started out, it was like, okay, what what patterns am am I gonna am I gonna know? Like, you got to have some black thread, some blue dun thread, some of your most popular hook sizes, and then a variety of of beads, maybe some. Um, like a, a rusty, rusty brown um, thread color as well for thorax on chronomids or the burnt orange. You know, maybe I'll have a, a fly tied with like a rusty brown thorax, but the sample is like, okay, it's black with a little silver rib, but it's got more of like a burnt orange collar on it. So you can kind of just change up the slightest details, but you're right. Like there's, I, I'd say that gives me some, some anxiety for sure. Okay, what? Yeah. Am I going to be looking for that I left at home on this trip? And so more often than not, I bring maybe a little bit too much with me. And uh, that's the beauty of like doing a multi-day trip is, you know, first day you're usually figuring out where the fish will be feeding, what time of day, and then dialing in, okay, that night I knew like with this throat sample that these were the insects. And I'll always take a picture of those throat samples as well, because then you have like almost a journal. You have the time of day that you took that picture. You have um, the exact date. So years from now, you can remember. Um, And then you get a a pure visual of the bugs that were hatching. And then you kind of, over the winter months, you scroll through those those pictures and look at your fly box and be like, okay, yeah, that was on this lake. 
Um, th- these chronomids were coming off. I'm going to tie six of these just in case for next season. And you, you just go nutty doing that. But. <laughs> so how do you organize it? Are you one of those people that organizes everything where you got your, on your hard drive, like, okay, this is the date, this is the trip, here's the photo and the, the stomach contents or how does that, how would you find it say like four years from now? Yeah, I, I organize things by, um, by like by month. And then in the months of like April, May, and June, it'll have to be a little bit more specific than that. Um, so certain times uh, with the photos, I'll, I'll just use the text, um, add text feature when you're editing photos. And I'll just put a little little header of like this lake or whatever. And then that just helps kind of jog my memory of those trips. Yeah, that's perfect. And you mentioned and then April, May, June. So more specific being that you have to be more specific on when and where and all that for that time versus say the middle of the summer. Yeah, I think like that's when some of the the best fishing happens. Um, So you definitely want to be more dialed for that. Um, But with our season, I do a lot of other hobbies as well. And so like trying to find time to always get out on the water because then we're into um, like bow hunting season come, you know, come mid mid summer that starts getting getting ramped up. Then we're into uh, we got like some some good salmon runs. So I change my tactics or going after like um, kokanee in some of the local lakes as well. Just a, a delicious eating fish. And so that's where usually spring is great trout fishing i'll be immersed in that and then i'll switch gears and get out you know my down riggers and my my flashers and hoochies and and uh, focus more on either kokanee or the salmon population so my my season kind of changes a little bit but i'd say to be honest with you dave this uh still waters this trout fishing like it's it's becoming more and more of an addiction the more i do it and my other hobbies seem to just kind of fade into the the uh yeah the background that's right (laughs) That's what they say. I always have that question in my mind out of people that listen, how many of us are conventional, do conventional fishing and fly fishing, right? And, and, uh, I mean, I know I've done a little of both and it seems like, I mean, I just, if I had to guess, I mean, what would you say if, if you ask like the people that listen that, um, well, I guess your channel might be different, but just in general, how many people do you think are both do some fly fishing and conventional fishing out there? I think, I think locally in, in Vernon, like we've got, we've got such an array of different types of fishing that I would say like in this city, there's, there's a lot of people that do a variety of things. If you get over to, to Kamloops, to Merritt, those areas, it's pretty dedicated Stillwater, you know, Panask, yeah. big, uh, big fish, right? And, and, uh, and so they're a little bit more, more geared towards that. For me personally, like it's, it's funny because last season my my wife said to me she's just like will you stop like catch and release trout fishing like I need you to go salmon fishing or hunting because we gotta fill the freezer That's and you right. just keep releasing everything and I'm like right 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 there's this thing called like you know food <laughs> like, I know it's very I hear you I I'm the same I, it's it, it's the same thing you know I mean because yeah obviously. I mean, I don't know. I think I love eating fish. And then when I get a, when I get a uh, deer for the freezer, that's a pretty amazing thing. Cause it's like, dang, that's, ah. you know, that, and then I remember back in the day, I haven't elk hunted for a while, but I remember the few elk I've gotten, I mean, talk about having plenty of food for the winter, you know, yeah. you, got, you got an elk in there, but, um, so this is good. So I want to, you know, before we got a couple more things that you were going to get, get out of here pretty quick, but we, um, I talked to you off uh, the, the banjo is a, is something you do as one of those hobbies. I'm curious. We've never done this before. I I had a little segment in here. I used to I'd say you know ask about music t- uh, preference and stuff like that, but that's a little boring. This is actually the real deal. Do, could you could you break that out and see if we could get a get a little lick here? Sure, sure, absolutely, Dave. Uh, let me. Uh, I'm just gonna get you over to to speakerphone yeah. so that I can be hands free to play the banjo. And uh, yeah, we'll see how it sounds. Totally. And feel free to do whatever, you know, you feel like, and uh, maybe we'll just give it a couple, whatever, a minute or two, and we'll kind of get a little, you know, I'm not saying I'm going to take this for the intro of the show, but I just want to hear something cool. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I'm just going to put you on speaker. Hopefully I don't hang up on you. Yeah.
Oh man, that that is super great. Sounds like you are. Uh, I mean, I have no idea. I've always loved the banjo. I think I don't. It seems like most people probably do. But are you like a pro banjo level, or like how long have you been doing this? <laughs> no, I think like I grew up playing playing in a lot of bands, and I was always the the bass guitarist, and I dabbled with drums a little bit. And um, I think about five years ago, um, I'm just I'm all about like nostalgia, right? And so like thinking about a day on like you know, a, a riverbank and the sun's coming down, you're having lunch. And I'm just like, I could see myself playing banjo and just yeah. like the entire sort of redneck experience and, and just that old timey lifestyle. Right. So, um, my wife ended up surprising me with, with a banjo. She knew I wanted to learn it. And then same thing, like when I grab onto something, I'm just like, I'm immersed in it. And so with banjo there, like quickly just picked it up and watching endless youtube videos and like my my poor wife having to put up with me yeah. and we've got uh, we've got some tenants in our basement suite that i'm just like hey listen guys i'm, I'm so sorry but um <laughs> and and that's just it right it's one of those instruments that you can take out to uh around a campfire mm -hmm. you can take it on a fishing trip and in the backwoods when you're camping you, you break out the the deliverance theme song yeah. and scare everyone <laughs> I it's know. just it's a lot of fun right it, it mixes like some some percussion with like the claw hammer style uh what i was doing there in that clip um and and you, you get the, the melody from it as well and then you throw on some finger picks and you can do the traditional like bluegrass style right and uh it's such a versatile instrument that like i haven't mastered it nowhere near that yet but uh you just progress at it right and yeah. as long as you're having fun then that makes it all worth it that is it. That's it. No, I, I've always loved, yeah, that whatever the style is, just the picking, and it's just so unique. I mean, the guitar is amazing, too, you know, obviously somebody going on a riff, but the banjo has just got this, that unique thing. So, yeah, thanks yeah. for doing that. This is this is really cool. I think people are going to love love hearing a little bit of that. And then and then on the banjo, is there, if we want to throw in a YouTube uh, video of some, you know, somebody out there that plays, any anything we, we could throw out there? Yeah, yeah. If anyone's, like, wanting to learn banjo um there's a couple really good guys that i learned from there's um there's jim panky he's got a, a great um sort of tutorial some different lessons and and right from the beginner stages to more advanced there's banjo ben clark as well learned a lot from him uh those would be kind of my my two main ones and then just listening to music as well like I love some of the old um, steel driver stuff, some Union Station, some um, you know old Crow Medicine show. Mm -hmm. A little bit more of the the newer newer vibe to that, but I'm loving that. Like, I'll put in there. I'll put in the uh, old Crow Medicine show because I know there's uh, what's that? They got at least one song that's super that was super popular. Oh, there's their wagon wheel. Yeah, wagon is, wheel. Yeah, that's a good one. And and. Uh, yeah, I, I love how it's it's uh, becoming more and more like prominent in in mainstream uh, country now, and even like for myself, like I've played a a few times at uh, at our our local church, right? And they're like, "Yeah, bring the banjo, like that's gonna put a sweet spin on this, you know, contemporary worship music." Yeah. And I'm like, "Okay, yeah, we can make this work." Nice. Nice. That's perfect. Okay. So, and, uh, and just to wrap up, I think we had one more uh, loose end on the, uh, on the vice. You mentioned your vice there. And what, what's your other vice you have there that maybe is something you, you ha you've had to give up or something that you still partake in that maybe is not the, the best for you? <laughs> the other vice. So something, what you mean uh, with maybe robbing me of, of time or something? Well, or it could be, yeah, anything. I always go back to like, for me, my vices are, you know, I used to chew tobacco, right? Like back okay. in the day, I had, I quit that with my kids. I, you know, drinking too much, whatever, you know, coffee or alcohol or something like that. Or it could be anything, like you said, just anything you think maybe, maybe it's something you think maybe. Well, I always say with, with these things is you, you can do everything, but as long as you do it in moderation, you're okay. What's that one thing you don't do in moderation that you do so much that it impacts everything else, maybe negatively? <laughs> I think like depending on the hobby and the season, my wife can attest to this. Like I throw myself full in for, you know, maybe a few weeks or a few months. I think like my addiction to the the gym is, is oh, the wow. other vice. So like when I'm not, um, either fly fishing, thinking about fly fishing, fly tying, or like thinking about hunting and bow, bow shooting, all that. Um, I, I can be at the gym maybe a little too much. And, uh, but for me, that's like, same thing as, as time flies, it's just therapy, right? You're, 
you're you're in your you're able to yeah. release those endorphins with with the gym you can clear your head and same with sitting down at the vice like you spend a couple hours in the evening and all the day's problems just kind of wash away as you get immersed and thinking about okay the next fishing trip and where i'm going to use this fly for and and uh so yeah that's my other vice is maybe a little too often at the gym yeah. and then i'll go like cold turkey and and forget about the gym for a couple of weeks and then yeah. i'm back to square one i'm like all these gains are lost that's right that's right and i always yeah. love to give a shout out whenever we get into the the fitness stuff uh jimmy kim uh, remix my fitness he's my guy up in actually ontario <laughs> and uh nice. and uh but uh I mean, that is a good one, right? Because I struggle with that as well. I mean, I struggle with like, oh man, I got to get there, you know, four times a week. I got to get there, whatever. I mean, it's, it's a struggle constantly. But what is it like when you're going crazy on this thing? How, how many hours are you putting into the gym per day? Yeah, I think it's like maybe upwards of like two hours. Like yeah. I'll just, I'll go too hard too soon and I won't realize that, hey, I'm not getting any younger. So then my, my wife will be laughing at me the next day because I can't walk. And I'm yeah. Just like, yeah, you know, I didn't have to do my personal best deadlifts last night for, right. you know, half, half hour, 45 minutes. And then the other thing is just like the, the time commitment. Like I've got a, a young daughter and, and the family life and work and all these hobbies, you know, they, yep. they take time. So you really got to be kind to yourself and just prioritize. But more than anything, find what fills you up. And so if you go, go back to those things and like, I think it's just perspective where, where it's like, okay, I might not get to go fishing from sun up up to sundown today but i can squeeze in a few hours and that's okay you know enjoy those few hours that you're on the water and and don't don't be looking over you know are the are the fish feeding more on the other side is the grass greener on the other side you know it's cherish what you have and be in that moment while you're in it right yeah yeah that's it. i love that i love that well we're gonna get out of here pretty quick and i just wanted to kind of summarize you know we I wanted to dig into the fly tying, obviously, and Stillwater. We touched on that. And, you know, for anything else, we will definitely send folks out, you know, to the YouTube channel. And is that is that kind of, uh, you, they just go to, tell us how to do that. If we want to find the follow up more on the fly tying stuff and learn from you, where should we go? Yeah, sure. Anyone's more than welcome to, you know, send me a friend request on Facebook, um, uh, Brandon Molzan. And then for Instagram, for YouTube, for TikTok, all my stuff is under the uh, the label Tyne is my vice. And then as well, subscribe to the Togans channel because they've got a team of like, I think we're up to 15 people now, 15 oh, wow fly tires, fly fishermen, um, that, you know, around the globe and they're adding content like daily, if not weekly and, uh, some, a, a great community and a great array of, you know, down in the, in the States, some up here in Canada, some over in Norway, like we've got, mm -hmm. we've got some guys from uh, the UK as well. So a great variety, whoever's listening can kind of tune in and, and follow those guys there. There you go. And it's not necessarily just a, a still water show is this a mix of different types of fishing or different types yeah. of tying and all sorts of stuff yeah yeah absolutely like i'm i'm learning so much from those other guys some of them are like just experts at at euro nymphing and river fishing and and uh some still water guys like myself so it's it's a good variety of knowledge there that's awesome okay well, Brandon, I mean, this is, uh, I, I say this occasionally, you know, when I have one that I want to talk for another hour, uh, you know, I kind of, I got to let you get out of here just to respect your time. But, um, I, you know, obviously there's a bunch of resources here and, you know, I think I'm going to be making some trips up there, you know, definitely. I would love to uh, connect, like you said, Justin at Togans and there's all sorts of cool people that I, I hopefully I'll be able to connect with you along the way as well. So, um, so yeah, any, um, I guess just give us a heads up in the next, from here on out, uh, you know, the next, the rest of this year, uh, anything new come for you? Want to give a shout out? Are you going to be, are you going to be doubling down on the flight tying and how's all that looking? <laughs> yeah, it's actually pretty fresh to, to us. Um, two nights ago, we actually just bought an anchorage. So we're, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not ideal time. I, I told my wife, I said, listen, I, I don't want to move. It's, it's spring fly fishing. Oh, wow. So you just bought like a, a property. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We just bought, uh, it's, it's smaller acreage backing onto crown land with like bow hunting in the back. We'll be able, be able to build some like tree stands and everything. Oh, wow. So the next couple of months, like we're, we're listing our house next week, getting photos tomorrow. So it's That's like, amazing. it's going to be busy, right? Is this like you said, crown, is that like a crown, the, the, the industrial company that owns the, 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 the big property adjacent? 
No, no, no. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's um it's BC like BC owned. So oh, no one's... Crown Crown. Yeah, we have a we have a company down here yeah. called Crown. Uh, what is it like Crown Zeller? But there's some companies that are actually. But the, yeah, this is the actual uh, like this is public property, public land. That's right, public land, hunting public lands. There's nothing like it. So that's going to be kind of my next couple of months is going to be you know trying to get out on the water as much as I can, but you know taking into into consideration that hey, listen, we've got to sell our house, we've got to pack up our house, and it's going to be a bit of a transitional spring, but then it should settle down for some some good uh, fall fly fishing, um, which can be equally as productive. We'll have to have a separate. Uh, podcast episode all about fly fishing in the fall right yeah but uh, yeah so that's going to be on my radar i had a couple spring trips planned which i might have to reevaluate now you know being away from home for for a week or 10 days at a time might not be in the cards this year but uh hopefully there's 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 next year and there'll still be fish in the water yeah and well just that i mean the property that's a super interesting thing we're kind of in the process too of of looking for something similar. How was that process for you? You know, because down here, uh, you know, obviously the market's crazy, but I mean, was that, was that kind of a crazy, like, how'd you find the right property? And, and is it pretty, is it like the one you've been waiting for, for a long time? Yeah, it was, it's pretty, I don't know, like all these things came together and we're just scratching our head. Like, wow, like this actually happened. We've been looking for the past, maybe a year and a half, two years, keeping an eye on the market and prices just keep going up and up. I know. And um, this particular one, we had multiple offers and got to give a huge shout out to my realtor. She was prompting us along the way and she said, hey guys, make it personal, don't get cheesy, but submit like a video of who you are, feature, you know, your two-year-old Frankie and let her work her, mm. her charm on the camera. And so we recorded this video and after they chose us their realtor shared and said hey nice touch with that video uh frankie won you guys that property there you go. and we're just holy crap this is awesome love that 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 there's the tip right there there's the tip yeah totally yeah pretty cutthroat market though prices do not seem to be coming down especially for for property people want to get out of dodge and kind of uh, get their sustainable living in check and so this gives us that opportunity Right on. And is this like a, is this closer to like a two acre property or like a, like a hundred acre property? No, no, it's on a small scale. It's, it's a, uh, yeah, two and a half acres. Yeah. And then with all the, uh, all the land and around it, and it's got a nice big porch for me to play my, my banjo out there. Wow. Serenade the wildlife. And is it just you, is it, you got, I mean, are you seeing, is there anybody else around you? There's uh there's neighbors on either side, but it's like, it's pretty, uh, Open pretty treed it's pretty treed up yeah and that is so cool we've got uh where it's sitting we've got lake views of, of the big cow lake and okanagan lake and we see all down the valley but you feel like you're just like living on a hillside so wow. it, it's pretty sur- that's really cool so you bought basically it's a a full-on like house with some is it just kind of a house with outbuildings or is it mainly that or is it what is it, a piece of property or you're building yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's got a, a beautiful home on it with, um, a detached three car garage with a, a full wood shop as well. Oh, wow. And, uh, so, you know, the, the world's our oyster there. There's a, there's already a, a huge meat locker for hanging some deer and, and I do my own, uh, butchering and, and make, you know, sausages and all the cuts and everything. Holy cow. You're good to go. So if, so if uh, if Russia comes in anytime soon and starts attacking, <laughs> you're you're in a pretty yeah. good spot. You could you could handle yourself up there. Yeah, we could survive for you know a few weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'd be okay. God, that's amazing. No, it's so cool to hear because I mean, like I said, we're we're kind of in that same place, like thinking like that, you know. And that's the cool thing is that when you align adjacent to you know public land, I mean, it's it like even if you have a, a small section, it's like it's you know however big, right? You're probably looking at like thousands of acres, right? Right there, where you could just go yeah. hunting. Yeah, it's going to be pretty endless and just something for, for Frankie to grow up with, you know, building tree forts. And I was always raised on like large acreages. And so, you, yeah, you're oh, okay. sleeping outside, you're you're immersed in that lifestyle and it, it does something to you for sure. It does. It does. That's amazing, man. I'm glad you, I'm glad we wrapped up with that. And, uh, you know, I think it's a good inspiration for for everybody out there just kind of to, to go for it. And I love the, I love the tip there on the video. I'm definitely going to utilize that one in the future. So um, <laughs> cool, sure. Brandon. Well, hey, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you taking all the time today to dig into this and um, yeah, and connecting to the, uh, you know, Togans and obviously they've been a big supporter of the podcast and everything. So yeah, this has been great and I'll, I'll keep in touch with you and look forward to your next video. 
Sounds great, Dave. I want to thank you so much for this opportunity. I really, really appreciated your time. So there you go. If you want to check out the show notes, check out the links and check out this episode, wetflyswing.com slash 317. 317, we are rolling, rolling along here. And uh, and there's nothing that's going to stop us. We're like a freight train out of control. Listener spotlight, Carl, Bluebird63, you know, you know who you are. I want to give you a shout out. Carl reached out a while back. He's up in the main area and noted uh, potentially getting some more warm water episodes, including bass. So, Carl, thanks for being a listener and supporter of this podcast. Appreciate everything you're doing and all the listens. And if you want to check it out right now, if you want, uh, if you want some more warm water action, you can send me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com, or check me out on social, wetflyswing, and I will definitely answer any message you send. I'd love it. Love it, love it, love it. If you had a chance to say hi, if you haven't connected yet, click that subscribe button. If you're brand new, if you've been holding on to the very end and you haven't uh, subscribed yet on your app of choice, real easy to do. Click that subscribe button and you are in and you're going to be assured to not miss that next episode. Okay. Off to the next one. What do we got next? 318. Man, what is what's left? Is this going to be a surprise? 318. What do we have left? What is 318 going to be? Let me check it out real quick. There we go. There we go. Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Uh, you asked for it. We got a musky. We got a musky episode with Bill. Bill from We Tie It. From the We Tie It Fly Shop. This is going to be a good one next week. Uh, give a shout out to Bill if you uh, get a chance. If you listen to that episode. Or even in advance to give, uh, give Bill a heads up. Maybe if you know him, you can stop by. Okay, I'm, I'm ranting and rolling, but we got some good stuff coming up here, including uh, that one with Bill and, uh, and some fly fishermen coming up soon. Hope you have a good week, and I hope to talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.